The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and welcome to our webinar today on UAE economic substance regime. My name is Fazila Gopalani and I'm the head of ACCA for the Middle East. Um, I would like to welcome Shiraz Khan, who I'm sure many of you have already heard before on our VAT uh, a webinar that we did a couple of weeks back um, from Altamimi. So I will now pass over um, to Shiraz. If you've got any questions, please do post them in the chat and at the end we'll have a question and answer session. I know a lot of ACCA members, you've been asking for this session. There's been a lot of interest in this topic. And so without further ado, Shiraz Khan. Thank you. Thank you, Fazila. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Shiraz. Uh, I'm the head of tax Al Tamimi across the Middle East. Uh, I've been at Al Tamimi with three years now, um, just over three years. And before that, I was the global head of tax at multinational uh, across 100 countries. And I'm actually a qualified barrister from the UK with more than 18 years uh, of tax experience internationally. So as Fazila said, um, the focus of today's session is economic substance. I think many of you have probably heard of economic substance in some shape or capacity. Um, and obviously there were notifications which many of you probably made uh, at the end of June. Uh, so the focus of, of this session is just to have a bit of a recap. Um, why was economic substance introduced? Uh, what's the scope of the economic substance regulations? Um, you know, who falls within the regime and what you're required to do? Uh, and more importantly, the, the real focus of this is what you should do next, because now the notifications are done and uh, you need to be compliant and obviously the penalties are quite heavy. So just to begin with, why were economic substance regulations uh, introduced? So as many of you know, we've um, over the past few decades, we've moved over from the brick and mortar concept of doing business. And essentially now with e-commerce and the advent of globalization, uh, there's many large multinationals operating internationally doing businesses in hundreds of countries. And effectively what was happening is many of these uh, companies were operating in high tax jurisdictions and also low tax jurisdictions. And they saw it as an opportunity to move money from high tax jurisdictions to low tax jurisdictions or no tax jurisdictions and pay no tax. Um, and therefore there was a mismatch essentially between where the profits were being booked and where the economic activity or the value was being created, uh, which was a cause for concern for many countries uh, and it was resulting in this essentially harmful uh, tax competition. So the OECD, which is an international body, um, they look at international tax reform and uh, the tax rules across border uh, in different countries. And they've been look at, looking at this issue for some time, in fact, since 1998. Uh, but the real driver behind this whole project where it got a lot of uh, initiative was in, in, in the last recession in 2008-2009. As a result of the recession, a number of G20 countries approached the OECD and told them we need to stop this base erosion and profit shifting, i.e. movement of profits from high tax countries into low tax countries. And obviously these countries were in recession, and they had budget deficits and they were desperate for income. And most of these countries, they don't have the luxury of natural resources and therefore they depend on their revenue from tax. So then the OECD looked at this uh, and they came out with 15 action points. One of them, which was action five. And this, this action five uh, of the action plan was, was in relation to harmful tax practices and based on fair tax competition. So the focus of the OECD was to look at and focus on preferential tax regimes uh, that are potentially harmful, uh, which essentially means that they have, as I said, no or low tax. Um, the tax rate is very low. Uh, they've got a regime which is ring fenced from the domestic economy. Uh, they don't have much fiscal transparency, so they don't share information. So therefore lack of uh, exchange of information. Uh, these countries have generally are uh, and a wide access to double tax treaties uh, and they also promote their regime for tax reasons. So this was action point five and uh, the UAE actually became a member uh, of uh, OECD BEPS inclusive framework uh, and this was in May 2018 and this essentially means that the UAE committed to 
you know, the four of these 15 action points which were initiated by the OECD, one of them which includes action point five. But essentially, the real driver why UAE introduced um, these regulations was partly this work from the OECD, UAE's commitment to the BEPS inclusive framework, but also the EU project. So the EU essentially blacklisted the UAE back in 2000, oops, sorry, it's just gone too far, too far ahead. They blacklisted uh, the UAE in 2017, December, and at that time, the UAE had made certain commitments. Uh, which which were supposed to be have uh, been met before the end of 2018, and they related into uh, to economic substance, but the UAE didn't meet those commitments. And then in March 2019, again, the EU blacklisted uh, the UAE again. Essentially, the EU uh, set up a code of conduct group, which assessed tax framework of different countries with no or nominal taxation for good governance. And they looked at tax transparency, fair tax competition and the implementation of BEPS measures, in particular the minimum standard. And essentially what they wanted was that countries shouldn't be set up to facilitate offshore structures or arrangements which are essentially aimed at attracting profits, which do not reflect the real economic activity of the country. And therefore, you shouldn't have a harmful tax regime. So if you have no or low tax in the country, then you should introduce economic substance regulations. And in the end, ultimately, the UAE was removed because it introduced these regulations, and that's why these regulations were fast-tracked to come off the blacklisting. Now, just to move on to some of the developments which have happened in terms of time. So, the three keys, keys, uh, three key pieces of legislation are the Cabinet Resolution Number 31 of 2009, uh, which was issued in, on 30 April 2019. Uh, and then there was also some guidance or directions uh, which were issued in September 2019, uh, which, were, which were through ministerial decision 2015 of 2019. Then there was also another cabinet resolution, number 58 of 2019, uh, which actually decided regulatory authorities, which was relevant for the purpose of the regulations. Then in January 2020, um, there was some clarification that certain activities were exempt. Uh, certain ownership by government entities. Uh, and then in January to April earlier this year, the Ministry of Finance issued uh, various forms of guidance, initially through publishing frequently asked questions. They also published some flowcharts uh, and provided a summary of relevant activities. Uh, and they also issued some guidance on what are relevant activities and what are core income generating activities. Uh, I know there's lots of terms here, but I'm going to cover these later on. Then essentially everyone who had a financial year end in 2019 uh, was required to submit a notification in early 2020 and various regulatory authorities had issued dates uh, when notification is required by. Uh, but then the Ministry of Finance issued a notification um, to, to, towards uh, May time, I think it was May 2020, and in that notification they extended the, the deadline for the notification to the end of June. Now, in practice, some of the regulatory authorities still required uh, licensees to notify maybe in May and others in the middle of June. And all, in all cases, everyone is required to notify before the end of June. Uh, and there was also another aspect of this COVID notification, which was issued by the Ministry of Finance, and it was in relation to satisfying the economic substance test. But I'll come on to that later on. Now, in terms of the scope of the economic substance regulations, uh, the economic substance regulations apply to a licensee. Uh, so if you're a natural or legal person and you're licensed by a competent li licensing authority in the UAE to carry out a relevant activity in the UAE, uh, then you're within the scope of these regulations. And you could be established in a free zone, you could be established as an offshore company. Essentially, any permit to do business in the UAE is all what's required. Uh, many people and clients ask the question that, okay, if we don't have the activity which we're doing in, your li in our license, are, are we still covered? Are, are we still subject to the regulations? Uh, if you're carrying on those activities, it, it doesn't matter if you haven't included in, them in the, your license, because essentially you have to take a substance of a form approach. So you may be licensed to do a certain activity, and that activity is not included within your license. But if, as a matter of fact, you are carrying on that activity, 
uh, then then you should be subject to these regulations. Again, like I said, it all, these regulations also apply to free zone companies and also offshore companies. So essentially, any company which is licensed to do business in the UAE, which is carrying on a relevant activity. Uh, there, there is a couple of exceptions, though, that in, in the case of government entities or entities which are owned 51% directly or indirectly by the government, uh, they're not subject to these regulations. Uh, but as you'll see later on, notification may still be required. Also, if you're not carrying on a relevant activity, uh, then essentially you're not subject to these regulations. It's all about carrying on a relevant activity. Uh, however, some regulatory authorities may still require you to notify. Uh, and then you've got a category where you may be carrying on a relevant activity, but you don't have any income from that activity. In that case, technically you're, you're required to notify, uh, but you don't have to meet the substance requirements. So as you can see, it's essentially you need to be carrying on a relevant activity. Uh, I think the other point is that these regulations only apply for financial years commencing on or after 1 January 2019. Uh, so if you've got any activities before that, they're not applicable for those periods. Uh, which brings me on to the next question. As you've seen, you need to be a licensee and carrying on a relevant activity. Uh, and this is critical in determining whether you're subject to these regulations or not. The regulations set out nine activities. And essentially these activities, all nine activities have a focus on uh, in terms of moving profits around. So these nine activities are considered to be high risk in terms of multinationals and international companies doing business. And these kind of activities result in the movement of profits. And that's why the focus is on these nine activities. If you're not carrying on these nine activities, you do not fall within the scope of the regulations, although you may be required to notify. So just to focus on some of these activities, uh, you've got the activity of a holding company. Uh, now, essentially, a holding company is one which does precisely that, which is holds shares and does nothing else. So the only income this holding company should have is income from dividends uh, or it should have income from capital gains. If the holding company carries on any other activity, uh, commercial activity, which is not holding, then it's not a holding company. So essentially, it has to be a pure holding company. Um, also, if the holding company is carrying on another relevant activity, then the requirements of this, uh, the holding relevant activity will not apply. Also, if your headquartered businesses, uh, business, which is quite common in the UAE, because the UAE is quite often a regional hub for many multinationals, and your headquartered business, if you provide services to foreign connected persons, um, you have to be taking the relevant management decisions and sometimes incur expenses on behalf of them. Uh, the key, I think, for headquarter business is that you're taking responsibility for the overall success of the group, and you're also responsible for the group's performance. Uh, so you, you may, for example, assume risk in relation to the activities being carried on by the foreign group companies, uh, or you may advise on the control of risks. Another uh, relevant activity which is important is distribution, a service center. Now, this has been uh, put together as one activity, but it's essentially two activities, distribution and service center, which are both separate. So in the case of service center, it's quite a, there's quite a broad scope. Uh, so if you're, if you're providing any sort of consulting or administrative services, you, you would fall within the service center activity, but you have to be providing it to a foreign connected person in connection with their business outside. So if you're providing services to a third party outside, uh, that's not within the scope of a service center business. And then you've got a distribution business. Um, for distribution business, you need to be purchasing goods from a foreign connected person. Uh, you need to be importing, storing the goods in the UAE and distributing them from outside the UAE. So if you've purchased goods from third parties, uh, that's not within the scope of a distribution center business. Another interesting uh, relevant activity is um, high-risk intellectual property. So in what circumstances are you a high-risk uh, if you satisfy two conditions? The first one is if, the, if you, as a licensee, you didn't create the intellectual property which you're holding for the purpose of your business. Uh, and also, if you acquired the intellectual property either from a connected person or in consideration for R&D by another person outside the UAE. And finally, if, you, if, if you've actually 
licensing the intellectual property to one or more connected persons uh, or generate income from the intellectual property as a result of the activities performed by those foreign connected persons. And also the second condition being that if you're carrying on R&D, uh, if you're not carrying on R&D, then essentially you've got a high risk IP business. And I'll come on to why that's important later on, but broadly it means more stringent requirements. And for holding companies, there's less stringent requirements. Now, what happens um, if you fall within the scope of uh, these regulations, which essentially means you're carrying on a relevant activity? Uh, there's, there's three things. First of all, you have to submit a notification, which many of you would have submitted already before the end of June. If you're carrying on a relevant activity and you haven't made that notification, you should do so immediately because there's penalties which are applicable. As I said earlier on, even if you're not carrying on a relevant activity, there's some um, regulatory authorities which may require you to notify. And there's a reason behind that, because they want to audit you against your self-assessment. So if you've told them that you're, you're not subject to these regulations, then they want to be able to audit you and assess you based on that self-assessment. Again, if you're not generating any income, but you have a relevant activity, uh, then in that case, you still have to notify. And if you're a government entity or you, you're, you're controlled by a government by more than 51%, you're excluded from the scope of these regulations, means that you don't have to meet the test, but you still have to notify. And it's for the same reasons I mentioned earlier on. Um, I think the other thing you have to do is you have to comply with the economic substance test, and this is on, on an annual basis. Uh, the economic substance test essentially means that you have to carry on within the UAE core income generating activities. Uh, you also have to be directed and managed in the UAE, uh, which means holding board meetings in the UAE, having UAE based directors, uh, maintaining minutes in the UAE as well. And also you have to satisfy the adequacy test. And the adequacy test applies to employees. Um, it also applies to expenditure and it also applies to physical premises and assets. So you have to make sure that you have a number of full-time qualified employees who are present in the UAE. Um, you incur expenditure here and you have a physical presence. You could also meet this test through outsourcing. So you could outsource uh, some of the activities or expenses or assets to third-party providers or even related companies. And you, you, you could outsource all these aspects. What you can't outsource is, is a direct and managed uh, test which requires you to have board meetings, so that you must do yourself. But however, if you do outsource, it's not as simple as that. It is cumbersome. You have to undertake certain controls and supervision of the outsourced entity. So you have to supervise them. Um, you have to make sure the outsource activity is being conducted in the UAE and the outsourcing provider has adequate substance in the UAE and they don't double count uh, any of the outsourced resources. Now, as I mentioned, if you're carrying on a holding company business, uh, there's reduced substance requirements. So all you have to do is comply with your existing uh, corporate filing and reporting requirements. And you just have to also make sure that you've got adequate employees and premises in the UAE. Uh, you don't have to make sure that you're actually directed and managed and controlled in the UAE. So no board meetings are required as such. And you know, you're also not required to have adequate expenditure. On the other hand, if you're a high risk intellectual property business, there, there's, a, there's a big, uh, there's a much higher standard applicable and there's additional supporting requirements as well. Uh, so you're presumed not to meet the economic substance requirements unless you demonstrate that you exercise a high degree of control over developing the intellectual property. Uh, you have adequate full-time employees with necessary qualifications that permanently reside and perform the activities in the UAE. Uh, and you also have a business plan uh, and showing the reasons for holding the intellectual property in the UAE. Uh, and you also make your strategic decisions here. Uh, so as you can see, it's quite cumbersome in that case. Now, finally, if, if you're subject to the regulations, uh, you're also required to submit a report, economic substance report, and this is required uh, within 12 months of your financial year end. And as part of submitting this report, you have to provide various pieces of information, essentially demonstrating that you've complied with these regulations and you have sufficient economic substance. Uh, 
so again, you know, the, the, you have to show the amount and type of your relevant income, the expenses, the assets, uh, the location of the business, uh, the details of the equipment, the full-time employees. Um, you also have to make this declaration that you're compliant, um, you're compliant with the economic substance requirements. Now, what are the consequences if you fail to comply with these regulations? Uh, if you don't file, if you don't file, or you file late, or you provide inaccurate information, uh, then there can be a fine up to for between ten and fifty thousand, uh, and you may also be presumed not to comply with the actual economic substance test. Uh, and if you fail to satisfy the economic substance test, or you don't report uh, the first year, you could be subject to a fine of ten to fifty thousand. And also. If you do it again consecutively the next year, uh, the competent authorities here could share the information with the foreign competent authorities of the parent company, ultimate parent company, and also the ultimate beneficial owner. And in addition to that, if you if if you have a consecutive failure to comply to comply, then they could also revoke your license, uh, not renew it, withdraw it, or suspend it. So the consequences are quite severe, and that's why it's important to make sure that you, you get this right. Now, moving on to what should you do to comply with the economic substance? I think just to summarize, if you're licensed in the UAE and you're carrying on an economic activity, uh, you are required to notify. Most of you would have notified already. Um, those of you that have notified uh, and now, you know, you may need to submit a report if you're carrying on a relevant activity. And for those of you who, are, who have a financial year end, December 2019, you'll be required to submit this report before the end of this year. Uh, but before you submit that report, you need to make sure you have economic substance, which means carrying on core income generating activities, uh, showing that you've got adequate employees, expenses and assets, and also demonstrating that you're directed and managed here, which I discussed earlier. And obviously the penalties are quite high. Um, so just to share some experience so far, um, what we've seen is that many clients are noticing uh, or focusing on the notification and the report which is required before the end of the year. Uh, there's not enough focus on the actual middle part, which is actually making sure that you're compliant with these regulations. Obviously, submitting the report and notifying are just two of the requirements. You're also required to make sure that you actually meet the economic substance test. And we know the format of the notification already. Um, it's not clear what the format is going to be for the submission of the report, but we know what will be essentially required, whether it'll be almost like in a questionnaire style or whether there'll be a detailed report uh, required, that remains to be seen. Uh, but if you don't notify your report, you're non-compliant. Well, you're also non-compliant if you don't meet the economic substance test. So therefore, it's critically important. Uh, I think what a number of clients haven't appreciated that there is a significant amount of work to be done before you even submit the report in making sure that you're actually compliant with these regulations. And as I said, the first report is required before the end of December for companies which have a December 2019 year end. So there is very limited time to undertake any remedial action and, and ch any changes which are required to be implemented need to be done before the submission of the report. And if you're not able to do that, then you can't really certify that you're compliant. And if you do certify that you're compliant and you're not compliant, then that's obviously, um, it, it subjects you to penalties. So I guess the only advice here is to make sure that you, you start the work now. Uh, and once you've notified and submitted the report, uh, then the authorities would actually start enfor enforcement action. So they're going to look into what you've submitted, whether it's accurate or not. And they have, I think, six years uh, from when the day you submit the report for them to actually audit you in relation to that. And they could ask any information to make sure that you've made the correct notification and that you're compliant with these regulations. And they could also ask you to demonstrate the position. But again, you know, the penalties are very, very high and the consequences of, uh, in terms of not complying or financial, um, you could also be reported to other authorities and even your licenses could be revoked, which means that it could affect your operations and your ability to carry on doing business. So the advice is to minimize this risk and completely mitigate it because it could affect your operations. Uh, and I know many of you are very keen to be compliant. It's just that my message is be proactive and manage the risk proactively 
uh, rather than wait until the report is required at the end of the year and start action then because it may be too late and it may leave you very limited time to actually take out any remedial action which may be required um, which ultimately means you result in non-compliance also ultimately someone from your organization whether it's someone in legal finance operations or compliance will be responsible for managing this risk and that's why you know if the responsibility falls with you so will the accountability but that's why it's important to, to make sure you're proactive and you also document your position that you've complied uh, and you, you you're also meeting the tests and the requirements so again i mean in terms of the what you need to do now and what you need to do next you need to review you would have done the notification already so if you haven't done it already then you should notify immediately to minimize penalty exposure uh, and generally speaking, you should uh, review the regulations to see that if the economic substance test is satisfied, uh, which means if you're carrying on a relevant activity, um, you need to you need to be carrying on core income generating activities here. You need to be direct uh, directed and managed in the UAE, which means local board meetings, uh, having a quorum of directors, and directors having sufficient expertise and knowledge, and the meeting minutes being kept locally. You also, as I said, we need to meet the adequacy test in relation to employees, expenses, and assets. So you need to have qualified employees. Um, you need to make sure the expenses are proportionate to the activities which are being carried on. And again, you could satisfy the, some of the, the activity tests and also the adequacy tests through outsourcing, uh, but it, it puts the onus on you to make sure that you supervise the outsource provider. Um, there's less stringent requirements, as I mentioned, for holding companies, but you have to be careful in the case of high-risk IP companies. And I think once you've done this assessment of whether you fall within these regulations, whether you're carrying on a relevant activity, which you should have done already, uh, then in that case, you need to see if you're compliant. So, so the first thing you need to do in that regard is do an assessment. Uh, and, and see where you are in terms of you know, your current compliance status. So where are you compared to what, what you're required to do? Uh, and then if obviously if you're not compliant, then you need to make changes uh, to, your, uh, to your business model and also do any restructuring which is required before the submission of the report in order to be compliant. And you also need to document, you need to focus on documentation, you need to document uh, that you're meeting the tests, uh, for example, you'll be, uh, the, the board meetings are happening in the UAE, and you're being directed and managed here. In the relation of COVID-19, as I mentioned earlier, there was an announcement by the Ministry of Finance, uh, which was almost like a relaxation. So they obviously acknowledge that because of COVID-19, businesses have been disrupted. There's many people stranded in different countries. They're unable to travel due to travel restrictions, quarantine requirements, self-quarantine. And therefore, maybe people can't come to the UAE to attend board meetings. Uh, so therefore, they've had a relaxation that, you know, you should try to make sure that you have UAE directors. And if you can't, um, you could have these board meetings uh, online, for example. Uh, so, so on the call, you could have these meetings, but you just have to document because of COVID-19. Obviously, this is not relevant for last year, uh, for the report at the end of this year. This will be relevant for the 2021 report. So the report you submit at the end of this year, this is going to be for the 2019 period. And COVID obviously was not a factor back then. But for 2020, COVID is a factor. And therefore, in 2020, if you can't have board meetings in the UAE, uh, you, you either try to get local directors or you document, you know, because of COVID-19, you can't have these meetings. Uh, and therefore, you won't be considered non-compliant with the regulations. Also, as I mentioned, you know, the notification has done now, but you should you should do it if, if you haven't done it already. Now coming on to um, the actual uh, submission of the report. So I'll just give you a couple of examples of when the submission is required. Uh, so if you have uh, December 2019 year end and your year financial year commenced on 1st January 2019, uh, then the reportable period for the purpose of the economic substance regulations is 2019, from 1 January 2019 to 31st December 2019. You would have already uh, made a uh, notification before the end of June. If you haven't done, you should do that already. 
Uh, but as I said, the report which is required to be submitted for this reporting period, uh, being 2019, is 12 months after the end of the period, uh, which is 31st December 2020, the end of this year. Now moving on to the second example. So in this case, you've got a, a year end which which doesn't start at the beginning of 2019, but starts you know a little bit later on. So you've got a year financial year beginning on the 1st of April 2019, and it goes on to the 31st March 2020. Uh, so in this case, this is your reporting period. Uh, so any periods before that, you know, 20 before 20 uh, before 31st March. Uh, to, uh, to, to 2019, you're not required to comply with economic substance regulations. You're not required to submit a report either. Remember, the economic substance uh, regulations only apply uh, for activities commencing on 1st of January 2019, financial years. So any period before that, you're not required to comply with these regulations. So the first reportable period would be 1st January, uh, 1st April 2019 uh, to 31st March 2020. And the report will be required by 31st March 2021, which is 12 months after the year end. In terms of the notification, um, I think the Ministry of Finance said you, you're not required to notify this year for this period because the period doesn't end in 2019. However, some regulatory authorities still required uh, companies to notify. So I think that that's, uh, that's covering the whole presentation now, so we could move on to questions and answers. Uh, I think the purpose of today's session was just to cover what's next. Uh, obviously, most of you have now notified, and now you're looking at reporting before the end of the year, and uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. Most of you are focusing on the reporting, and you may wait till December, as I said, but you need to act now because there may be action points that you're required to undertake in order to be compliant. Uh, and not get your operations stopped or not be subject to penalties. Fantastic. So Thank you so much, Shiraz. Um, we have got lots of questions. So, shall I start? Sure. Um, we have a license for both manufacturing and trading, and we are supplying the goods to our GCC branches. So, shall we need, do, do we need to notify as yes? on the forms for both licenses or only one? Okay, so the, the manufacturing in the UAE and they're providing uh, the goods to other uh, countries across the GCC? GCC, yeah. Yeah, in, in that case, I mean, if they're trading, they're not supplying services and they, they're distributing to those other countries, they'll fall with it. If they've imported those products from a foreign related party, uh, and then they're exporting them to other related parties, only then will be, they be subject to the economic substance regulations. And if they don't, then they're not carrying on a relevant activity. Okay. All so right. essentially, the, the, fo the focus is on, you know, I mean, they could fall under two potential relevant activities. One is service centre, and obviously, based on the question, it doesn't look like that's happening. Yeah. So we're only concerned yeah. with goods. And for service centre, you should be providing those services uh, to other uh, entities outside the GCC uh, or other foreign controlled entities within the GCC. But for the distribution, you need to be importing from connected persons and then uh, exporting. So if that's not happening, you wouldn't fall within the subject of these regulations. Okay. If, if we purchase something in the UAE and recharged at cost to one of the affiliate companies outside the UAE, will it be treated as income under distribution and service center? If the charging at cost. Yeah, it says recharged at cost. Yeah, even if you're recharging at cost, you're charging, so it should still be included within the within the income from the distribution activity. Okay. In what form should we maintain the documentation to support the ESR notification? That's a good question. Um, of course, you need to have any supporting documentation. So if you have board resolutions to, for example, support the fact that your directors are not here, um, for outsourcing, you also need to maintain, it's not just having, it's having documentation, but even before that, it's important to have the controls in place. Uh, because if you don't have the controls in place, uh, and then you could document 
that you've got some sufficient control over the over the outsourcing party. And obviously, one way to do that would be the agreement. So you can set out in the outsourcing agreement, you know, these relevant controls, and make sure you just monitor them as well. It's not just a case of having it in the agreement and not complying with those requirements. So having it in the agreement is one thing, but then you also need to make sure and practice that you're following up on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fourth question, does a branch of a parent company having a separate license need to comply with ESR? Yes, I mean, if you look at the, the focus of the economic substance regulations, um, so I'm assuming that the parent company here is outside. So the focus is on any, um, any foreign group which is actually booking profits here. So whether it's through a branch or a company, uh, so if your foreign if your parent is overseas and they have a branch here and you're booking income here then the economic substance regulations are applicable and you're re required to comply with those tests and that's why if you don't have any income from the activity uh, these regulations don't apply you may be required to notify uh, but essentially if you don't have any income they're not relevant because the whole fo focus of these regulations is to is to make sure that you have economic substance if you're booking profits and income here and if you're not booking the income here and then they have no relevance okay real estate financing to a tenant for and for interest income does it come under the scope of esr real estate financing uh to a tenant yeah, yeah, I mean, any, any 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 sort of financing that that's provided uh, is covered. So if if you're providing financing, you'll fall within the relevant activities. Okay. Is there any specific format introduced by relevant authorities for detailed disclosure report, and what will be the documents or reports we need to attach with the report? Yeah, I mean, as I said, there, there are some requirements in relation to the report, but at the moment it's not clear what, what format the, the is, going, is going to take place, whether they'll require you to submit documents, whether they'll have a questionnaire style approach. Uh, but ultimately, whether they have a questionnaire style approach or you have to submit a detailed report, a report which you have to attach, you have to do the background work and make sure you have that documentation in place. Um, you know, and obviously it helped to have a report in place to make sure that you've covered everything and you've analysed and you've reviewed your own situation uh, to see whether you comply with the regulations or not. And then the uh, report could be submitted on the back of that. But like I said, at this stage, it's not clear what format the report will be issued in. I think the Ministry mm -hmm. of Finance will issue some guidance later on and maybe regulatory authorities will also issue guidance. Uh, but regardless, like I said, of whatever format it is, you need to do your homework and uh, because it may be just a questionnaire style. Now, if you're just completing questions, there's still a lot of risk which is attached to that. So you have to make sure that you, you do your homework and you document the position uh, just in case there's any challenge later on or you're audited by the Ministry of Finance or the regulatory authority. Okay. The questions just keep on coming. Um, if an entity purchases goods from foreign related parties but distributes goods in the UAE, will it be considered as distribution business relevant activity? Uh, no, it won't because you need to distribute the goods outside the UAE. So if you're importing them and you're distributing them in the UAE, that, that doesn't fall within the distribution center activity. Okay. For service centre activity, does related entity concept um, based on common ownership only, or is it based on common directorship too? Uh, I think that's a good question. Um, it just says connected persons. Um, presumably, you could cover both. Uh, I mean, if you could drop me a, a, if you could drop me that in an email, I'd be happy to get back to you on the details of that. Okay. Um, our company is incorporated in Dubai, but we have a warehouse in Jaffa. Do we have to submit notification to both authorities? Do they have a license in Jaffa? Because because you may you it, it depends on license. So for each license, mm. you have to satisfy the economic substance requirement. So if you just have a warehouse in in uh, in another location and you're incorporated in Dubai, and that's the only license you have, then there's only one requirement. 
On the other hand, if you have two licenses and uh, depending on whether both of them, you, under both licenses, you, you carry on a relevant activity, uh, then you, you may need to make two notifications. Okay. Um, I, I think the, yeah, the other point to add is that, you know, for each relevant activity, you have to meet the substance test uh, and, and submit a report as well. Uh, but then in some cases, maybe one relevant activity is ancillary or incidental to the other. In that case, you know, you don't have to report uh, in a duplicate way. So you could just report it under the same relevant activity. But again, you have to make the call on whether you're carrying on two relevant activities which are different. One is incidental and, uh, to the other because you have to take a position, you have to document it, and then you have to essentially report it. And that's why it's important to do the work before you actually uh, submit the report, which is required by the end of the year. All of that thinking needs to be done now, so you're ready for it. You don't need to wait for mm. the format of the report because you already know what's going into that report. And ultimately, what the most important thing is that you have to demonstrate that you meet economic substance test, uh, and you also have to self-certify that you've done that. So it's a declaration that you're making, and you have to have all that supporting work and evidence in the background. Okay. All right. Maybe two more questions. Um, if a company was incorporated August 2019, was it required to file ESR notification by 30th of June? If, if it was incorporated in uh, August, August 2019. 19, yeah. And technically speaking, the Ministry of Finance say that if, if your financial year doesn't end in 2019, you're not required to notify in 2020. But some regulatory authorities did take the position that um, even if you're if you were incorporated even in 2020 before the notification date, you should still notify. So it depends on your regulatory authority, and some of them issued some guidance. Like I said, some required you to notify, others didn't. But technically speaking, you're not required to, according to the Ministry of Finance. The regulations were actually quite vague on this in terms of when the notification is required. Uh, other than say that there's an annual requirement to notify, they didn't really provide any detail. But like I said, the mm -hmm. Ministry of Finance confirmed that uh, you don't have to notify in 2020 if, if your year doesn't end in, in December 2019. So if it straddles 2020, then no need, but you may, from a practical perspective, be still required depending on the regulatory authority. Okay. Um, are you okay to keep going? Because there's quite a bit of questions. How that's fine you, yeah that's fine I mean, I mean i could take okay. a few more questions and then after that you know if there's any more questions i'm happy to take them over the email okay fantastic so i'll just um ask some sort of generic ones that have been asked um is there any clarity about how mainland entities which carry out a lease finance business file an es notification to the central bank maybe that wasn't very generic <laughs> Yeah, that's quite a lease finance business. Mm, lease finance business. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'll have to get back to you on that one. Uh, but obviously, yeah, if you're carrying yeah. on lease finance business, that's a relevant activity. Uh, I don't think there's any detail in relation to that as yet. Because if you're a okay. banking business and you're onshore, uh, then you're required to submit the report to the central bank. If you're offshore in the DIFC or ADGM, then the relevant authority is the DIFC or ADGM. Uh, now, in the case of the finance lease business, it, it, you know, it'd be a little bit complicated. I'll get back to you if you could ask that question in an email. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. OK, I do have two generic ones here. If there's income accrued but not received in the bank account, do we count that as income earned during the year? If you haven't received the income in the bank account, uh, that doesn't matter. It's not about receiving the income in your bank account or not. Mm. I think the relevant thing is if you accrued the income in your accounts. Okay. Uh, so you may never receive the income in the bank account. It's all about are you including it in your financial statements, the income. Mm -hmm. so if you're including that income in 2019, then that's relevant. Then it's included. It's on a accrual basis. Yeah. Um, if we are recharging expenses to a foreign related party, does it fall under ESR? It depends what those uh, expenses you are recharging. If, if you're recharging expenses and there's an underlying service, uh, then technically speaking, you're, you're just charging for service which you're providing. Mm. 
so then it would fall under the service center category. Okay. All right. Um, okay, this will definitely be the last question. Do we need to present to both authority? Oh no, I don't think that's a part of another question. One second. Um, if a company gave an interest bearing loan to its related party, will it fall under ESR? Yes, there's, as I said, there's a relevant activity which is financing or leasing and, and similarly, you know, that's, that's also two activities. So if you're providing an interest bearing loan, that would fall under financing. Uh, so whether you provide the interest bearing loan to a related party or non-related party, uh, that's considered a relevant activity. Uh, for which you would be required to meet the economic substance test. And there's not much guidance on if it's a one-off loan, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, that's going to be uh, below the threshold. Uh, so technically speaking, even if it's a one-off loan, at the moment, in the absence of any further clarification, you're still required to meet the economic substance test and report it. Okay. Wow, such a technical topic. Um, Thank you to all the attendees. We've had about 130 people online um, and more will probably listen to the recording. Shiraz, once again, we're so happy as ACCA to be working and collaborating with Altamimi and yourself. Um, you're a wealth of knowledge in this area and we look forward to doing many more webinars with yourself going forward. To those ACCA members that have attended this webinar, um, you know, the technical stuff is very important, the technical knowledge, and um, we do hope that you've been enjoying these technical sessions that we have been holding um, for you all since COVID-19, since lockdown has happened. Be rest assured, these sort of webinars will continue. We will be tapping into um, technical experts across the region to deliver such webinars for you. We would appreciate your feedback. Um, you know, does 11 o'clock work for you? Do you want 5 p.m.? You know, um, any other topics that you would like, please do post them in the chat. Um, Helen from ACCA is watching um, and looking at these messages. So do give us some feedback about your thoughts and what else is it that you require. Economic substance actually came out of another um, webinar that we did, and that's where members asked we would like something on this so this was delivered based on your feedback i do hope all of you found it useful it is also new so things are um i think that's why there's been so many questions so do email us with anything else um our email address is in the chat shiraz thank you once again and we look forward to welcoming you to another webinar in the near future for thank now you for that. enjoy thank your you. day thank you Bye-bye.